so yeah, just, just to set the scene of where we are, right? So chocolate at the minute has got no concept of compilation from source. And I think it's fair to say that it's not on our immediate horizon. It's not an immediate vision for what chocolate is. Um, but we have a very, a very vocal uh, community member who thinks that this is a killer missing feature of what chocolate is and what it brings to the table. And it, it should be implemented as soon as possible. Right, and you've met this fairly vocal uh, Twitter person. I think you've had a, a, a conversation with him about homebrew and what it does and things. And in, in conversation with you, you kind of spoke around how uh, homebrew has or had the option of compilation from source for packages, and how that's potentially being removed. So I was just, I was genuinely just curious about the history of uh, why homebrew put that in in the first place, why it's been removed, and kind of the the in-betweens at the minute because from my perspective um it's really not something that's asked for very often from a windows perspective now i i have a mac i don't really develop on a mac i i, I fire up virtual machines on my mac to run windows as it, but i like to have so i wouldn't class myself as knowing everything about what homebrew does and how it does things and general uh development on a mac um so I know I'm missing some context about why he would want that, but from a purely from a Windows perspective, I don't see that that is a much needed feature for uh, an application package manager. And I'm genuinely just curious what your thoughts on it all are, because I tried pushing back on this guy saying, look, not you're like one person in my eight years of having chocolatey who wants this piece of functionality, and you're being quite adamant about it and that it should be put in, offering no feedback on he'll help out or he'll do some of the work just that it should happen and we've, we've spoken on dms and it, uh, the, the immediate pushback is we're not going to do it but again just from uh, the homebrew perspective why did you do it why are you taking it out uh, that sort of thing and uh, like i say and, and from from my point anything i can feed back to you i'm well, I'm, I'm more than happy to give that but um i'm kind of picking your brain at the minute so yeah yeah cool yeah of course so i guess like homebrew's probably initial reasoning for doing it is just it's much easier i guess by default on okay. Mac when it yep. was when homebrew was first created i guess yeah 10 years ago next month i think or this month yep. um like it would it's more or less was some relatively simple kind of Ruby scripts around running configure make make install for yep. Linux tools that are already built on, on Linux and stuff like that. Um, and at the time, all the other kind of package managers were built from source. Again, not from a, I think, particularly ideological standpoint, it's just much easier than you can avoid having okay. to do any hosting of uh, even source files. You can download them directly from the server, which is what Homebrew does. Um, and then you don't need to kind of build binaries and worry about like what machines they work on, what ones they weren't, and what OSs they work on, what ones they weren't. So mm. basically, it was a if you build everything from scratch on each machine, then you get you don't have to, there's basically a lot of work you don't have to do. And then the side effect is you can optimize things more specifically for each individual machine. And you know okay. you go and pass, ensure that you're built for the specific processor your machine is running on. And yeah, yeah, yeah. You know all the system libraries you're using and yada yada yada. Um, so over time, fast forward a few years, and we started introducing binary packages for, which we call bottles, and um, for a specific formula that took a really long time to build, like Qt and Boost. I think were the first two, where like you know there are multiple hours of compilation and stuff like that. And okay. it's like a good time saver to do that. Uh, again. Mm -hmm. Initially, that was a very sort of manual process. It was more or less just I built them on my machine and then uploaded them somewhere and people could download gotcha. them and you know, install them on their machines. Right. Uh, fast forward a few more years and you have a situation where we have CI machines which are doing that for every pull request and then part of the pull request workflow is basically every package that can or makes sense to kind of uh, build a binary for. We then build a binary for that and we ship that to users. Um, and if you use the default Humber installation location, then pretty much everything uh, that does any building from source will use that binary instead. Um, mm -hmm. And you end up getting to a situation then where we have the kind of happy path for homebrew involves you basically never building from source, which is right. much quicker 
And the thing that we ended up finding and the main motivation for us is dramatically less error prone for users. Mm -hmm. And that's partly a, you know, less errors for users means your software is generally better and more pleasant to use, but also partly the, you know, having sub 20 volunteer maintainers and no corporate backing or meaningful mm -hmm. income stream uh, to speak of at the time, at least we've got a, a little bit more coming in now, but certainly not enough to, you know, it's no one's paid job to work on no. them. So minimizing the number of issues we get starts to become a little bit of a feature in itself. Uh, Indeed. And the, the downside for users being okay, well, in some very CPU heavy workloads, the performance is slightly reduced because, um, you know, it's maybe not as optimized for your system, but then helpfully we, because we build up a, a binary package for each OS version and Apple are, you know, well, something more aggressive than Microsoft are cutting off old versions on old CPUs. We can say, okay, well, we're going to build for the old, all the CPU that platform supports, which then starts yeah. to get towards newer CPUs and stuff like that. Um, and then you get, again, this is where we were probably six months ago or, or less when this conversation started, where uh, we actually, we've been telling people for a few years, basically, okay, like this is the happy part, this is the sad part, but then we would still be getting a bunch of issues from people who mm. set a environment variable, say, that says build everything from source. Um, and when they did that, they would often run into problems and they would file issues yeah. and Sometimes some of those issues would be, you know, things that our CI hadn't picked up, but more often than not, it would be, well, we can't reproduce this. And yeah. because the environment is slightly different to ours, 99.9% .9 of the users for this package are not building from source and everything's working fine for them. So yeah. why don't you just do that then? Um, and yeah, and you end up getting a little bit of, of kind of conflict or disagreement or whatever. Um, or at the very least, like the way people, some people want issue trackers to work, which isn't the way I like it to work, which is you just have thousands of issues just sitting there, never fixed, no one's ever gonna work on yeah. them, but you know, it's an issue a user has experienced, so you shouldn't close it. Uh, so that's when kind of we took the decision to basically just say, well, the, the kind of global set one environment variable and every single thing builds from source is a bad model. And instead, what we're going to do is make it, you have to individually pass a flag every time you want to build stuff from source and you need to specify every individual package you want to build from source when you want to do that. Um, gotcha. And the reasoning being basically, you will have a better experience and we'll get less issues, which is, is good for us. Uh, now, I guess the slightly hidden part of that is because we've still been built on the foundations of a from source package manager, and because we support installing things in random locations or still on OS versions where we don't provide binaries anymore, there are still a bunch of configurations which we would say un are unsupported but still relatively widely used um, that result in users building stuff from source. So my understanding is we're in a pretty different situation from that perspective from Chocolatey because we're we're still we're basically like aspiring to be a binary package manager now but we are built on top of the foundations of our gotcha. from source package manager and we will fall back to that if for whatever reason you can't use the particular binary we've, we've built um, yeah. so yeah so basically that's that's kind of where where we've come from and where we've ended up and stuff like that because it, it, it definitely sounds like it is completely polar opposite then so where chocolate started was literally there had to be an msi or an exe that it was the compiled binary that someone had produced yeah. and then it was responsible for doing the installation. Really what Chocolate was bringing to the table initially was a way of orchestrating and um, automating that in a way that uh, the end user reaped the benefits. They could walk up to a machine, install a bunch of packages that would install a bunch of applications on their machine and their job would be done. There's, there's no, there's the whole click, 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 next, next, next is gone. And on a Windows world, it's literally installed and ready to be used. Um, the, the, the whole concept of compiling an application from source it, it 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 scares the living bejesus out of me because you, you you think about the level of dependencies that you would need on a Windows machine, whether it's the .NET framework, whether it's .NET Core, whether it's Python, whether it's the C++, all of those things that you would need in place to compile that application from source to then make it installable, that on, it, it, I, I don't even know where we would start, if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that person on Twitter doesn't understand that or 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 his 
concept of what would be required is 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 limited in some way to one specific uh, technology stack. But even that, I mean, if you think about something like Ruby on Windows, getting that to compile and work properly on Windows is a nightmare compared to running that on a, a Mac a machine or a Linux machine. So. Yeah, I don't know where we would start, uh, but he, he, his pushback was uh, quite adamant that it needed to be done. And but he never really gave any examples of uh, packages or pa applications that he was looking to to have that for. Um, and it was just when I heard that Homebrew was uh, removing, I, I didn't quite realize it had been that uh, years that you've been talking about doing this. I thought this was something that was getting flipped on, kind of uh, more recently, or flipped off rather more recently. Um, I was just, like I say, genuinely curious as to the history. Um, but it sounds like for the same reasons that we wouldn't want to do it, it's the same reasons that you guys have moved away from doing it uh, in, in homebrew land. Yeah, and I feel like it's even more extreme from uh, your like situation. I mean, I, I've kind of, my previous life before I was a, a homebrew developer, I would sort of worked at a cross-platform consultancy company and I, and we sort of like alternated doing development between Linux Linux, Mac, and Windows projects and stuff like that. So mm. I feel like I've got a reasonable understanding of kind of using each. I probably still use each on a sort of week by week basis and stuff like that. Yeah. But like my take is almost like Macs are somewhere in between the middle where you have a situation where the given software on your machine, a decent chunk of it is, you know, binary distributed by either by Apple or by yeah. you know, other developers or whoever, where you, you the expectation is you download binaries. Again, uh, you know, most people on Macs are not building their own version of Google Chromium from source and whatever oh, okay. they wanted yeah. to. And um, then that stuff's a bit of a pain in the ass. Um, and then in the Linux world, you have a situation where, I mean, pretty much every Linux distro, pretty much everything you get on your system is being built from source by someone. Um, yeah. And maybe not you. And then in the Windows world, you know, the sources aren't available for a lot of stuff. And as you said, like, oh, that's a good point. Yeah, it's a very good the, point. Yeah. The development setup side of things is again significantly more involved. I mean, we we have on on Mac, you know, a certain amount of prerequisites that we say, you know, you, you may need to install Xcode or the Xcode command mm -hmm. line tools and stuff like that. But that's yeah. you know, it's a relatively simple thing. Whereas on Windows, there's not just a sort of like do these three clicks or install this one package and you're ready to basically build pretty exactly. much on your, on, your Linux, on your Windows machine. And the other thing that I guess is related to that is, you know, it, you would need to have some way in Chocolate itself of saying, of being able to bootstrap all of the development dependencies and stuff as well. It would need to be able to install Visual Studio yeah. and all those other things. And then you start to get down the, the route of licensing and everything like that. And it, it, it becomes from my take significantly significantly more complex even if you were wanting to build that and yep. then for me i guess the interesting thing with the twitter thread was there's a few i feel like there's, there's a few valid points with you know why building from source is a good idea and there's a few invalid ones like one of the the valid ones is in some use cases in some software you can have a fairly significantly measurable performance impact mm, yeah but that's again like does that is that outweighed by um, building everything for every user on, you know, from scratch on their own machines? No, almost certainly not. You know, yeah. but again, I'm sure if you're a, uh, I guess, to think of a, a very prominent Windows ecosystem, like, you know, video games, for example, like, I would imagine there's, there's a fair number of them who are saying, okay, well, we've got some library or whatever that we've brought in-house, we could just use the, the binary we've been provided by, but actually if you, you know, compile these with SSE 4.2 instructions, then we get a big performance increase and 25% yeah. you know, increased frame rate in the scene or whatever it may be. And like, if you have measurements like that, then you know, by all means, that, that doesn't seem, you know, I, I don't think that binaries are better for every workload in every situation, but it's for a, a package manager level, when you say, I want to build everything from source, since I, I get, start to get very dubious that that's I agree. beneficial. And then there's there's a weird one that keeps going around, and people say the same thing with Homebrew sometimes as well, but you know, the, the kind of security aspect that somehow it's more secure to trust things being built from source than things from binary. And I, I kind of see that as being a little bit of a nonsense, because I mean, you're just passing the trust from one place to another. You know, you're passing your trust from Homebrew's, say, binary packages and our checksumming to our download and check something of source packages instead yeah. um, the, the upstream servers provided by those folks. And I mean, unless you're going to go through and 
all the all the source code of everything that you're doing, which no one is, and um, you know, then it's it seems a little bit of a kind of silly argument from my perspective. And then there's the kind of I guess the last one is the sort of like oh well you learn more or something by having all this text scrolling past you on the screen. And I, I used to use a a source based Linux distro, and I felt the same way um, when I was using that. Uh, but I mean, I think you don't you only really learn stuff in that situation when things go wrong and you kind of have to dig in yourself and fix them. And then I would say, yeah, in a source space backs manager, it's generally it's easier to kind of, you know, debug and fiddle with things because you are, the development workflow is generally more similar to the, the, the normal installation workflow in your machine. But I'm not convinced that people are, are learning stuff about how things work based on that. And then again, that argument is kind of based on there's a smaller, much smaller subset of people who are interested in doing that learning. Yeah, exactly. And those and those are the people who are interested in having the ability to compile from source. Mm -hmm. But that number is pales in comparison to the amount of people that just want to do choco install blah or brew install blah and have it working. Because like I say, on a Windows perspective, if you tried to do that, let's pick an example of one that I would know would be a nightmare. Um, like something like, like Team City. If you, there is a Choco install Team City, but to do a Choco install Team City from source, you would need to have an entire Java uh, development environment with all of the um, dependencies that it has. So the, the change between doing a Choco install Team City to doing a Choco install Team City from source, you would have to have this ton of additional dependencies downloaded to make that compilation work to then do the install we're talking probably hours at that point, as opposed to the five minutes to do the installation on the binary that comes from JetBrains. So yeah. it, it's it's night and day, but it just it just seemed that this guy was <laughs> he was like wholly adamant that it needed to be done. And I'm like, I'm clearly missing something, but um, it doesn't sound like I I am. Um, it's just the no. I, I, it feels like it's a preference. Some of these things as well. I mean, you see on Linux where you get uh, you know you have distributions like Gen2, which are kind of purely source-based, and then distributions like, you know, Debian or Ubuntu, where, I mean, as much as people claim that, you know, they provide more source building than Homebrew does, in reality, they are designed to be used in a way that if you use the default set of commands and follow all the guides online, you are never going to end up building stuff from source. And um, that mm. doesn't have a specific licensing reason to do that, like, you know, GPU drivers for your kernel or whatever it may be. But... Uh, you know, it, people will have preferences for those different models. And I, I think it's it's unsurprising to me where on Mac and Windows, where you have a reduced ecosystem of package managers, that you get people who, you know, would normally have just gone off and used something else, say, oh, well, actually, no, I would prefer that I'm able to um, to do this stuff. You know, and it it's, there's you know, I don't disagree with people's desire to feel that way. But again, it's, it does it necessitate adding to a, a feature roadmap? Probably not. Um, yeah. There's also the, I think with Homebrew's case as well, we've seen over time, it's like, what does your typical user look like as well? So back in the from source days of Homebrew, where everything was, you know, essentially a, a relatively thin wrapper around building stuff in your machine, you know, the, the initial, the first kind of Homebrew users tended to be very technical, very GitHub savvy, almost all, people who are doing development for a living or at least kind of as a, a, a very major hobby for them. So when they ran into problems, then they were usually able to fix their own problems and submit stuff yeah. back. The problem is when that grows or when I would imagine in Chalkley's case, you don't have a clear majority of people being, you know, skilled developers who are using your tool and you have yeah. say sysadmins or other very technical people, but people who aren't, you know, adept at coding, then yeah. you end up in the situation where that directly translates to an increased support for the project because you have a bunch of people now who you've given themselves the ability to shoot themselves in the foot, but <laughs> they have no real way of like figuring out what they've done it, how they've yeah. done it, how to fix it, how to resolve it. And yeah. and yeah, and for us that just meant that we're getting more and more issues because someone's read somewhere that this increases your performance, uh, yeah. but then they don't know how to resolve that. Um, or yeah. they don't want to, or whatever. Agreed. Okay, so I mean, like I say, that. So I mean, I've not heard from the guy for a while. So I, he seems to have gone quiet again. I think he's been sedated a little bit in terms <laughs> of um, what he's looking for. But I mean, I, I also get the impression he's 
he is actively trying to help the community. Yeah, I mean, oh, he, of course. He is, he is reaching out to, I get the impression, I think he might work in a, like in a, in a university. So he's got very, all the packages that he's using seem to be very mathematical uh, in basis. Um, so he's, he's, I've seen him reaching out to various, um, uh, I want to say companies, but the, or the, the vendors of those applications and yep. encouraging them to create packages for the likes of Scoop and the, for the likes of Chocolate and for Homebrew to encourage that ecosystem to, to flourish. And, and I've got no qualms with that. Um, and that's obviously good for everyone in general. Um, but like I say, that it was just this one issue where he was just like, no, it needs to do this. It needs to do this. I'm like, you know what? I, I, I wouldn't even know where to start. Like even just even right, look, looking at a blank bit of paper and trying to figure out how you would start to put those pieces in place to uh, allow for something like that. It's just mind boggling. It really, it really would be. So I'm like, I was, part of me was kind of really happy to hear that homebrew was stopping it because that, that kind of beating us with that stick, if you like, to say, well, homebrew does it, so chocolate has to do it. It, it kind of helped a little bit. Yep. But obviously, um, I would imagine that there, there would be a percentage of your users who are going to be annoyed that that has become less of a priority and no longer going yeah. to support forward. So, I mean, there's, there's some users created a kind of fork of homebrew. It doesn't seem to right. you know, be really actively being developed and stuff like that. But no, I mean, there's definitely a, a subset who kind of want to do that. And, and it's kind of funny because, again, those users, I think they, I was initially <laughs> blocked from the fork, I think, because they <laughs> anticipated that I would be somehow furious that, that they're kind of circumventing kind of one of my ideas with stuff like this. But I, I yeah. mean, I'm very much the opposite. I mean, for me, it's, I, I, I'm not thinking people shouldn't build from source. Well, not from, with my homebrew hat on. With my, uh, with my slightly green hat on, I, I wonder about <laughs> the best use of our resources of the planet is yeah. rebuilding the same package on, on millions of machines. But anyway, um, but no, but like, oh, from serious, more seriously, like, you know, from a homebrew perspective, the best thing I can think of when we remove a feature that we are, we feel we're not able to support to the quality that we, we want to. That I mean, the best thing for me and for the community is that someone else says, well, I can That's do this, it. I'm going yeah. to do this, and they step up and do that themselves. And that, that seems like a great outcome for everyone, really, because then you get the situation where, you know, the community gets what they want and we get what we want as well. Indeed. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I actively encourage, and I guess perhaps the same with Jocity, you know, it's, could, could one build, if they wanted to, a wrapper around stuff like this? Um, instead of demanding the project support it itself, like maybe it could be a wrapper or a plugin or who knows. And, and then as well, you can sort of, which is often taken as a sort of typical open source way of telling people to go away, but it's generally not intended that way. Like, you it, know, well, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Say, you know, I mean, well, if you're, if you're the one who's really engaged in this, then perhaps you could be the one to kind of yeah. get it going and get it built and stuff like that. And, and we have definitely the there's, there's, de there's definitely a mechanism within Chocolatey for those yeah. extension points to allow them to do just that. I mean, that's that's really how the um, the, the commercial offering of Chocolatey, that's yeah. kind of how it works. The, the extension point is that we um, essentially override some of those core uh core commands that are choco install choco update all of those with the commercial version so when we install the extension it's using the commercial version of that command mm -hmm. rather than open source one so if they wanted to create a, a compilation from source and override that install command in the exact same way there's definitely a way that they could do that um i'm not saying it would be easy and i like to say that, that blank bit of paper staring at me saying i don't know how to do it but it would be no small undertaking but i mean the extension points are there to allow someone to do it. Um, yeah. But it felt in this scenario that the, the person in question was literally do this for me. I, I can't do it. I don't know how to do it, but I want it. It was what, was what I took away from it all. So, uh, but yeah. we all know where that ends up and it ends yeah. up. Yeah. No <laughs> it, so, um, Cause no, is there anything that Chalkty kind of, uh, if you excuse my ignorance, I mean, are there anything where, you know, the upstream project provides source and, Chocolate, you like build the binaries which you then distribute, or do you only distribute upstream created binaries? So we, so we only, so our from a purely from a Windows perspective, we yeah. are at the behest of um, distribution licenses. So we need to make sure that um, we do not distribute anything that we're not allowed to, right? Mm -hmm. So that's uh, the 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 majority of packages on chocolate.org are those that are 
just reaching out to the internet to grab that pre-compiled binary from somewhere. So that will be reaching out to JetBrains, it'll be reaching out to Microsoft. So literally all it is a URL, that URL downloads and then Chocolate automates the installation of that thing. Now, more and more packages are becoming what we refer to as embedded packages. So those are embedded packages that contain the EXE or the MSI to do the install. But we can only do that when we have distribution rights or there are distribution rights. Um, so from a moderation standpoint, uh, we as moderators have to make sure that the distribution rights of that license allow that to, to go into that package, right? Now, there are some uh, packages on Chocolatey that have pre-compiled binaries that a community maintainer has compiled and they have embedded them because the license allows for that. Yep. But what we ask for then in the, we, we have the concept of what's called a verification.txt file. And that is a file that goes into the nutkeg, into the new package that says where that binary came from. So in the case of uh, just embedding a pre-built binary from somewhere, it would be go to this website, uh, download the file, compare it to the checksum that I'm saying is in there. And as a moderator, I can say that's a tick in a box. I've verified that that comes from a valid source. But there's one that recently came up where some dude was literally recompiling from source. So I, as a moderator, had to essentially take his verification steps, spin up a VM, install all the dependencies, compile that, and make sure that the end result of that EXE match the, um, the the checksum that he said was in his package and i was able to do that but that that's a shit ton of work let's not let's not make two that's not, that's not a, a small effort to go through for that one package uh, from a moderation standpoint so and that's the only one that i'm aware of there's only one package of the 6500 unique packages on chocolatey there's only one that i'm aware of that actually compiles from source um, and that's because there are no other binaries that we can point yeah. to um, that someone has pre-made it. Um, but even in the even if there were, we would need in that verification.txt file like a, a link from the source code to that mirror to say that this is a valid mirror. We can't just have Joe Blogs off the street saying this is a compiled version of this application because he could have slipstream anything into that EXE to make yeah, it do something just intent, right? So we need the the our origin website, whichever the project is, to say that this is a valid source to get this EXE from. Now, nine times out of 10, or probably more than that, that's an obvious one because here's the Microsoft homepage for something, here's a direct link but via an AKS.ms link or something, and we can validate that that EXE is the one that is meant to be, um, and the checksum matches in, in all those things. But um, like I say, it's the, majority of packages probably 90 to 95 are literally here's just a url to a website and go and download it but that comes with its own problems because vendors as you probably know like to change the thing at the end of that url without telling anyone so that it doesn't they haven't bumped the version number but they've changed the exe of the msi at the end of that url that Inevitably, inevitably, inevitably breaks the chocolatey package because when we validate against the checksum for the thing that's meant to be at the end of that URL, they're then different and chocolatey says, I can't install you anymore because yeah. the checksum doesn't match. Um, and that happens more than you would like to think. Um, <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I'm sure. So, I mean, we have Homebrew Cask, which used to be a separate project, but it's now part of the Homebrew project itself. But like, you know, yeah. the brew cask install commands. So that's effectively the same way that works. So that's when you when you install Chrome or Java or whatever it may be, like that's installed in the same way that you know we download yeah. from the, the third party site with a third party provided binary and then we install it that way and stuff like that. So I mean in some ways the the kind of you know the, the homebrew comparison, even then, like it points out that that's not a great one where you should be saying, well, actually chocolate isn't a direct comparison to homebrew. Um but, you know, I'm not saying you should be saying this, but, you know, a, a community member who's doing that comparison should be comparing homebrew cask and homebrew. Um, and again, similarly, if someone came to us and said, oh, well, we want a way to do brew cask install from source, then we would do the same thing and say, well, you know, for, for the vast majority of packages, this isn't even possible because the sources aren't yeah. available. And for the small minority where it is possible, then, you know, it, it doesn't become worth the, the workload. I mean, for us, we have a fallback in that case that we can say, okay, well, we'll, we'll punt that into a, a kind of a binary package or whatever. And I, ironically, we have kind of the opposite problem with some stuff where we have a bunch of, you know, like Mac GUIs, which are built from source, which we mm -hmm. would really rather they weren't because the, the installation and 
compilation experience or anything like that are not pleasant. Even for us to be doing that, it's 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 yeah, nice yeah, yeah. that provides that. But no, I, and I guess in some ways that would be the, you know, if, if I was thinking about the kind of that user who's kind of advocating for the stuff, it's like, well, if, if you ended up with a world where instead of it being, you know, one package with that workflow you described earlier, I mean, if that became 10 packages, 100 packages, 1,000 packages, then all of a sudden I'm sure you probably would end up building the tooling necessary True. to make that a, a less manual process to, to verify. Exactly. Uh, there is the, the manual, the, the, the moderation process at the minute is wholly manual. I mean, yeah. it's, I like to say that the moderation that we have on chocolate.org is probably one of the best things about it, but also one of the worst things about it yeah. because it provides some validation that what is there is uh, good, but it also has this um, manual effort on the part of our moderators that are community members that aren't getting paid for doing anything that have to then sit and put eyes on individual packages to make sure that they're doing what they're meant to be doing. Um, now we have provided some automation around those things, but you can't automate everything yep. uh, in terms of validating version numbers and certain URLs aren't going to the uh, malicious places and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so I, I mean, it's the same with us. I mean, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, when we started initially doing binary packages for Homebrew, it was one or two packages that were built on my physical machine. I mean, for the first few versions of those packages, it was literally not even in a VM. It was like, you know, it was back when sure. VMs yeah. the new shiny. It was like literally just build them on my machine, tarball them up, upload them to the internet, and that, yeah. you know, that that was kind of enough. Um, and and to be honest, I guess the thing that this makes me think is if that remained one or two packages today out of our whatever it is, three thousand five hundred or something we have, then all of a sudden it starts to look like well, any sort of automation around that isn't really worth the the workflow. If it's if it's one package that's getting updated once a month, and it you know yeah. takes an hour of someone's time to go and build that on the machine where they're not having to babysit them that anyway. So yeah, no, I think it's, it's definitely interesting to kind of compare and contrast. Mm, definitely. Yeah. Cause I mean, I was gonna, so the one thing that you said there about the binaries that you are compiling and yeah. making available. So as you said, that's just kind of shifting the onus away from the uh, creators of that source code to homebrew. So, mm -hmm. um, what what's the stop okay so this is a a complete naive question so what's the stop some malicious person a malicious actor getting into the homebrew ci servers and doing yep. st malicious stuff on there yeah i mean the answer is uh i guess our best efforts in yeah, sysadmin okay. and stuff like that i mean but our, our goal eventually is because we had um physical machines originally now we have some vms which are in a like um, company who provides them for us free, like Mac Stadium, who uh, running on ESX and stuff like that on Apple hardware. Right. But our goal is eventually to migrate this stuff entirely to Azure pipelines or some other kind of um, CI provider, so that it's like literally we we have no yeah, okay. control over this stuff at all. And um, yeah. our, our binaries ourselves, we do check someone download as you would expect, um, but yeah. then also we have. Um, the CDM provider Bintray we use, they freeze them after like 30 days, I think. So after 30 days, you can't modify an existing file. So even if you were, yeah. say, able to find some, uh, check some collision or something like that in SHA-256, then, um, yeah, then after 30 days, you can't modify those those artifacts anyway. So okay. um, that's that's not a problem. But yeah, but basically, I, I agree. Like the, at the moment, the, the workflow for exploiting us would be relatively similar to exploiting the upstream packages but still gotcha. i i okay. would rather that there was more or less a non-existent workflow there that it's just yeah, something that other people handle because you know sysadmin is not either anyone in the projects especially strong suit you know we've got a few people who've been paid to do that but you know i don't yeah. think anyone really wants to be doing that stuff for homebrew so ideally we'll just find a way of making it, that work go away no, it was, like I said, that was just a genuine curiosity because um, I, I don't think I quite put the pieces together. I mean, the, the majority of things that I've got installed on my Mac are um, casks. Uh, yeah. I don't have, a, I don't have a, a very few that is actually just a brew install. Yeah. Mo, mo, most applications that I use my Mac are cask installs. So um, I don't think I quite put the pieces together in terms of what I was getting when um, I did a brew install. But that's, that's good to know, actually. Um, yeah, I, I shudder to think even how you put all that together. But it's 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 good that it's there, no doubt. So, 
Uh, but no, that's been useful. So I, uh, I, I appreciate your time. Uh, no, no, very good to talk about this stuff. Much appreciated. So.